Six, breathtaking views. From the rooftop terrace of my hotel, high up above the twenty-fifth floor, the view of Rio de Janeiro was breathtaking. Like everybody else, I had seen pictures, films, TV programs, and travel magazines which featured this most famed of South American holiday destinations, but nothing had prepared me for the dramatic beauty of the place. The sky was bright blue, and the sun was hot on my face. Below me, I could see the long, curved strip of Copacabana Beach. Even from this height, it was possible to make out groups of people playing volleyball or lying on the sand, and the cars moving up and down the seafront seemed to glow with heat and excitement. Over to the right, a rocky cliff rose up above the beach, limiting the extent of the almost white sand, while to the left, the extraordinary lump of Sugarloaf Mountain, a great big iced lolly of a rock. Almost seemed to be smiling at me, inviting me to visit, or perhaps that's just how it seems now. Looking back, I could see a cable car hanging from the wires that snaked towards its summit. Out here in the bright glare of the sun, I still felt miserable, but already it was a different kind of misery, more immediate, more alive, like a sharp pain with the promise of relief. There was something almost exciting about it. On the roof of the Rio Atlantica Hotel, there was a large swimming pool, poolside chairs, and a bar. I had come up here last night when I had arrived, and now, even though I knew I had a lot to do, I couldn't resist it. And so, an hour after breakfast, here I was, all English and white-skinned, wearing my swimming trunks, ready for a swim. The water was warm when I dived in, and for a few minutes I swam around, just enjoying the luxury of it all. Not much more than twenty-four hours ago, I had been sitting in my house with two English policemen asking me awkward questions on the other side of the world. Now here I was in the bright sunshine, and already some of my troubles seemed thousands of miles away. This was another world. A world without musicians and disappearances, a world where Malgosha and I, Malgosha, how could I have forgotten her, even for a minute, even in the warmth of this exciting new place? I opened my mouth in surprise, and immediately swallowed a liter of water. I started to cough and swallowed more water. I made my way to the side of the pool, coughing and spluttering. Are you all right? Said a cheerful singing voice, which glittered like the sun on the water. <coughs> yes, I coughed. I'm fine, and coughed some more. Here, said the new voice, heavily accented, warm and friendly. Let me give you a hand. I looked up straight into the sun. I screwed up my eyes. There was a woman standing at the poolside. I pulled myself out of the pool, still coughing and flicking my wet hair out of my eyes. I looked at the person who had been talking to me. She was probably a bit younger than me, dressed in a bright green bikini, her skin tanned a dark brown, the thick black hair falling in tight curls over her shoulders. She had the biggest smile I had ever seen. You'd better be careful," she laughed. That white skin of yours is going to burn bright red in the sun. That is, if you don't drown first. I should have been insulted, but she sounded so cheerful that I had to laugh with her. I'll be careful," I said. But thanks. I am Sandra," she said. Welcome to Rio. This is your first time. In Rio," I answered. Yes. I'm Derek, by the way, from England. Ah, from England, Queen Elizabeth, Prince Charles, the tragic story of Princess Diana. Well, there's a bit more to it than that," I said, feeling slightly defensive. Anyway, where are you from? Me? 
said Sandra. I am a true carioca. What's a carioca? I said. A carioca is someone from Rio de Janeiro, the most beautiful place in the world, don't you think? It's difficult to tell, I said. I haven't been to all that many places. Well, anyway, my new friend continued, are you going to buy me a beer? Isn't it a bit early? I answered. It's never too early, Sandra replied. Anyway, you look as if you need one. We walked over to the bar. I was amazed at how quickly the water dried on my skin. I ordered two beers. So, said Sandra, taking a sip from her bottle, are you here on holiday? Not really, I answered. Not on holiday. So what is this? Business? she asked. No, I replied. It isn't business. I stopped. I didn't quite know how to explain. Are you being mysterious on purpose? said the beautiful girl beside me, sounding a little annoyed. No, I'm sorry, I'm not, I said. It's just that, well, it's a bit difficult to explain why I'm here. Try me, she said, and I suddenly realized that I knew absolutely nothing about her. It was probably just the foreign sky and the fantastic place I was in that had made me talk to her so freely in the first place. Look, I protested, I don't know anything about you, anything at all. I know that sounds rude, but... Not rude, she laughed, just rather boring. Still, if you really want to know, my brother's the manager of this hotel and so I can come here any time I want and have a swim in safety. What's wrong with the sea? I asked. Oh, nothing, really. But Rio is not always very comfortable. There are some difficult people about. Anyway, she went on, now that you know more about me, you can answer my question. Why have you come to Rio? I'm looking for someone, I said. Wow! She laughed. That sounds dramatic. Who are you looking for? My wife. It sounded so stupid, so humiliating. And someone else. Ah, said my friend. She has left you. Yes. No, I don't know. I had started now, and I didn't know how to stop. And when I had told her just about everything... She said nothing for a bit. And you really want to find her? Sandra asked. Yes, of course, I said. That's why I'm here. Whatever the consequences? She insisted. Yes, yes, of course. All right, she said, standing up as if to go. Meet me in the lobby downstairs in fifteen minutes, and I'll take you to see someone. He might be able to help you. Oswaldo Morales was a large man with gold rings on his short fingers and an expensive gold watch strapped around his large wrist. He had thin black hair combed forward across his sweaty skull, and his brightly colored short-sleeved shirt was stretched tight across his large stomach. He was smoking the biggest, smelliest cigar I have ever seen, and he sat behind a large wooden desk, the kind teachers used to have in their classrooms, which was covered with papers, ashtrays, three dirty coffee cups, and a telephone that must have been at least sixty years old. There were two filing cabinets on his left with half-open drawers, an old air-conditioning machine which was completely ineffective rattled away noisily behind him. Sandra! he cried, taking his feet off the desk and getting up awkwardly. How are you, my love? How nice to see you! He edged his way around the desk and kissed her on the cheek. My, he said, you are looking beautiful as always. And you are looking, well, the same as usual, too, Sandra said. Yes, I know, replied the fat man. 
It's terrible. But what can I do? I don't have any time for exercise. And anyway, I hate it. And the only other possibility is to cut down on the amount I eat and drink. And frankly, my dear, that is too terrible to think of. His accent was more difficult to understand than Sandra's. I wondered if they were speaking English just for my benefit. Anyway, he went on, I suppose this is the Englishman you told me about when you rang? He smiled at me. Yes, yes, that's me, I replied. The room was very hot, and the smoke made it difficult to breathe. Maybe it was the jet lag, but I was feeling rather ill. And you want me to find someone for you, I think, he said, standing close. Your wife, I think. Is that right, Mr.—、Um, Armstrong, I said. Derek Armstrong. Can you find her? I mean, are you any good? Listen here, Derek Armstrong, said the large man, sounding more amused than offended. I can find anyone if they're in this city. It may take some time, and it may take money, though I'm not very good at collecting money, as you can see. But I always get there in the end. By the way, Mr. Armstrong, what do you do when you're at home? I am a musician, a viola player, I replied. A musician, eh? I could have been a musician too. Why, I could be that Italian, what's his name, Luciano Pava, something. If I had a voice, that is. And he slapped his stomach and laughed. The thing I found out about Oswaldo is that when he laughed, really laughed, everybody else ended up laughing too. He was cheerful, disorganized, dangerous. And really good fun to be with. Over the next few days, we became firm friends, I think, though he was only one more strange person in this strange, extraordinary land I was in, a land with hidden dangers and many surprises. Now then, he said, when we had all stopped laughing, it is time we got down to details. Why do you think your wife is in Rio de Janeiro? Perhaps she is somewhere else. Are you sure that she is in Brazil? Pretty sure, I said, and I told him about the email on the computer. I told him about Tibor, about the old days when we were music students, about the stories from Poland. I told him the story of my life. I told him that my wife had disappeared. And that the police had come looking for her. When I had finished, nobody said anything for a minute. Sandra lit a cigarette, adding to the unbearable fog in the hot room. Well, well, Oswaldo said finally. And if I find your wife and this Tibor, what then? I haven't the slightest idea, I told him. I haven't really got that far. All right, all right. But you are here. That is all I need to know. For the moment, you've given me quite a lot to go on. Do you have a photo of your wife with you? That would be most helpful. I pulled my wallet from my back pocket and took out two small pictures of Malgosha, the kind you get in those photo booths at stations and airports. Will these do? She is beautiful, your wife. Oswaldo sighed dreamily. This is what I'll do, he announced suddenly. I'll start making inquiries at the airport, and I'll talk to some of my musical contacts. Maybe this Tibor person has been involved in music here, if he was a music student all those years ago. But with your English police getting all interested in your wife's movements, my nose tells me, he tapped the end of his nose with his finger, that this doesn't have much to do with music at all. Still, we shall see. I will contact you in twenty-four hours when I have found out something. 
Now go back to your hotel. Sandra, this poor man looks as if he will pass out right here in my office, and then we will have to carry him home. Take him away. At the door, I looked back at the large private detective. He was sitting in his chair again, leaning back, his hands behind his head, staring at the ceiling. So, what did you think of Oswaldo the Cuban? Sandra asked me as we drove fast through the streets. Cuban, I replied. I assumed he was from here. Well, he is, really. All the foreigners who come here, if they stay long enough, they become Cariocas too. Oswaldo is one of us now. And, by the way, don't be fooled. He may look extraordinary, but he's good at his job. Can I ask you a question? I said to her as the taxi pulled up outside the hotel. Of course, said my beautiful companion. Why are you helping me like this? I asked her. It had been puzzling me all day. What, you think I am trying to pick you up? You think this is a pull? No, no, I, I didn't mean that, I said, embarrassed and wishing that I hadn't asked. But you've been so nice to me. It's my day off. I was curious, that's all. I like, what do you say, being nosy. I enjoy talking to English-speaking people. Anyway, she laughed, what makes you think you're such a good prospect anyway? One jet-lagged British man, a little sunburnt already, who's miserable because he can't find his wife. Now tell me, what's so special about that? We were inside the hotel lobby now, where the air conditioning worked fine. Look, said Sandra, I can tell you're tired. Why don't you go up to your room, have a shower, go to bed and sleep for a couple of hours? Then what do you say we can go and have dinner? What do you think of that? I think that's wonderful, I said sleepily, and waving goodbye, I walked over to the lift and made my way to my room. I woke up refreshed. Looking out of the window, I saw Copacabana in the evening light, and for a moment I felt happy, but only for a moment. The telephone rang in my room, and I answered it. It was Sandra, waiting for me down in the lobby. When I stepped out of the lift, she was there with another man, about my own age. This is Paul, she said. A friend. I thought you'd like to have a friend, a colleague. Hello, said Paul, in a recognizably British accent, which surprised me, because from his brown skin and cheerful clothes I would have assumed that he was from Rio. Paul's one of the ones I told you about, Sandra laughed. An adopted carioca. He's been here too long. He'll probably never go back. What do you do here? I asked him as he walked towards the entrance. Teach English he said. I came out here on a one-year contract, and I've sort of stayed. You must like it here, I told him. Yes and no. I mean, of course I do. It's the most exciting place I've ever lived. But it drives me crazy, too. Come on, Sandra said to the two of us, and we got into a taxi. Twenty minutes later, we were in a cable car, swaying upwards towards the summit of Paudiasuka, Sugarloaf Mountain. Looking down made me feel distinctly nervous. Is this thing safe? I asked. Of course it is! Don't be such a baby! Sandra laughed at me. Just think of the view you are going to have! She was right. From the restaurant at the top of the mountain, we could see out over to Santos Dumont Airport, with planes taking off towards us every few minutes. For a moment it was worrying, but each time the planes turned to the left before they got to Sugarloaf Mountain and disappeared into the night. The Ponche Aérea Air Bridge, Paul said, backwards and forwards to Sao Paulo. Planes leave every fifteen minutes. I enjoyed that meal 
The view was fantastic, and the company was excellent. Sandra was beautiful and funny. Paul was good company, kind and agreeable. I came here because my wife left me, he told me at one stage. So I suppose we have something in common. But at least she didn't just disappear. I knew where she'd gone to. Was it bad? I mean, difficult for you? I asked him. At the time it was terrible, yes. But I got over it in the end. Time, you know. And Brazil, one of the greatest countries on earth. And people like Sandra here? Are you two? I asked. I had been puzzled by their relationship. Oh, no. Once, perhaps, eh, Sandra? We're just good friends, Sandra said definitely. Paul was about to say something, but then there was a ringing sound. Sandra reached into her handbag, pulled out a mobile phone, and answered it. Don't you just hate those things? Paul said. Unless they're yours, of course. He grinned, showing me the phone strapped to his belt. You've got to have one of these here. I mean, apart from the classes I give at the Institute, I do private classes, so I have to keep in touch with my students. Sandra talked briefly into the phone in Portuguese. Then she listened for a couple of minutes before pressing a little red button to switch her mobile off. That was Oswaldo she said, looking at me. He thinks he's found your Tibor. He wants to know what you want to do now. Chapter 7 Voices in the Distance Tell me again where we're going, I said to Oswaldo as we drove along by the sea. Angra dos Reis, Oswaldo replied, swerving to avoid two motorcyclists who suddenly appeared on our right. Playground of the rich. Well, some of it is anyway. It's on an inland sea. People say it's beautiful. They have holiday homes out there. You don't sound as if you like it very much, I said, trying not to watch the road in front of us. Since my companion didn't seem particularly interested in it, I felt I shouldn't be either. Oh, it's all right, I suppose, he laughed. But me, I prefer cities. Lots of people, cars, noise, bars, all that kind of thing. I need to be surrounded by people, a lot of people, and to feel them, hear them living their noisy, complicated lives all around me. That's why I do this job, I suppose. It gives me an excuse to poke my nose into other people's business, find out what they're doing and why, find out who they are. God, I love the life I lead. He dug me in the side with his elbow, and for one scary moment he only had one hand lightly on the steering wheel. For what seemed like hours he was looking at me, not the road. He rolled down the window and threw out the stub of his cigar. We travelled on in silence, and I wondered what we would find at the end of our journey. We're in luck, Oswaldo had said when I talked to him from my room after Sandra and Paul had dropped me back at the hotel. I think I've found this Tibor guy, so if you're right... We can probably find your wife, too. What do you mean? I asked. Where is he? How did you find him? Hey, wait a minute! Oswaldo's large voice bellowed down the phone line. Not so fast, okay? Just calm down. Okay, okay, but just explain. Sure. Well... I went off to the airport like I told you I was going to. I took those photos of your wife, the ones you gave me in my office, and I started by checking all the direct flights from London two days before you arrived. You were right, by the way. Right, I replied, wishing he'd get on with his story. What about? She used her maiden name to travel. 
She didn't buy a ticket as Malgosha Armstrong, but as Malgosha Kovalevska. She came in on a British Airways flight, and luckily one of the airport policemen who was keeping an eye on the baggage hall is a friend of mine. We've done each other some favors in the past. And, well, this man, Reynaldo, he noticed your wife. The red hair, he said, was beautiful. He couldn't take his eyes off her. She reminded him of an actress he was especially keen on. When the doors opened, he saw her go through to the crowd of people there. And out there, you're not going to like this bit. Go on, I said through clenched teeth. Go on, Oswaldo, please. All right. She went up to a man waiting there, and... My friend says she flung her arms round him. He remembered that particularly because he thought how lucky the guy was. But it didn't surprise him, because this guy was always lucky. A man with powerful friends. Someone the police knew a lot about, but someone they'd never managed to pin anything on, even though he was a real bad guy. So... Who was he? I asked, knowing the answer perfectly well, but hoping against hope that it wasn't him. I could see my wife throwing herself into his arms. I wished the picture of the meeting Oswaldo had just described wasn't so clear in my mind. He was Tibor Arkady, as you suspected. So then, I think to myself, find out where this Tibor is and we found Mrs. Armstrong. And the best bit is, I didn't even have to go looking for information about where he lives, because everyone in the police force knows where he is, Reynaldo told me. So now I know where we will probably find your wife. Where? Where is he? About two hours' drive from Rio. I'm going to go out there tomorrow morning. I'll be back in the afternoon with some definite news. I'm coming with you, I told him immediately, without thinking about it. That's not a good idea, Oswaldo said, sounding suddenly serious. My friend told me about this, Tibor, you see. He's a very dangerous man, very dangerous. People who come into contact with him have died, Renaldo says and I believe him. Now listen, I'm used to that kind of thing. It's my job. But you... I'm coming, I repeated. If you ever want me to pay you, I'm coming. It was the only thing I could think of to persuade him. You can only come, Oswaldo sighed down the end of the phone line, if you promise to do exactly what I tell you to do. And now, here we were, speeding along the road to find my beautiful wife in the arms of Tibor, the ex-conductor, who, according to the stories Renaldo had told the Cuban detective, had added danger, smuggling, and murder to the list of his charms. And I didn't know if I was more scared of Oswaldo's driving or of what we were going to see. There, Oswaldo said, pointing through the trees at the house below us. That's the one. That's Tibor's place. It was a large bungalow sticking out of the steep hillside which went down to the water, the inland sea. At the bottom of the slope I could see steps leading down to a jetty where two powerful-looking speedboats were tied up. On three sides of the house there was a large wooden terrace looking out over the sea. I could see other houses on the curving hillside to the right and the left. The inland sea stretched away into the distance between high hills. It was a scene of great beauty. It was quiet, too. Occasionally a snatch of conversation from one of the houses came to us on the light wind, or the sound of a car in the distance. Otherwise, it was very peaceful. At least, we thought it was, 
But then, behind us, we heard the sound of a plane getting nearer and nearer. I looked behind me, and there it was, a small seaplane, painted dark blue with golden rays on its wings, flashing over our heads so low you could almost touch it. Look, Oswaldo said, it's going to land. We watched as it came down, cutting a great white scar in the water, before turning round and heading back towards the wooden jetty below Tibor's house. When it got near its destination, the engine was switched off and the plane drifted in towards us. Two men got out and walked towards the house. Below us, three other men walked out from the house onto the terrace and looked over the rails. Two of them wore white suits and face masks, like something from a science fiction film. They were carrying cases and a strange-looking machine. Then the third man, the one in normal clothes, turned round, and I caught sight of his face for the first time in more than ten years. That's him! I cried, shocked despite the fact that I was seeing what I had expected to see. That's Tibor. Even after all this time I recognize him. He looks the same, a bit fatter. Quiet! Oswaldo hissed. You want them to hear us? To see us? One of the men with Tibor looked up at that point and for a moment I thought we'd been discovered. But then he turned back to say hello to the two men who had arrived on the plane. They all started to talk urgently. Then Tibor and one of the new arrivals went back into the house while the white-suited men walked towards the plane. Oswaldo and I crawled down the hill, keeping out of sight, until we were much nearer the house. We could hear a conversation, some shouting. And then, suddenly, I heard a voice I was sure I recognized. A female voice. Malgosha's voice. That was enough for me. I got up from behind the tree we were using to hide and started running down the hill. Before I knew what was happening, I'd been hit by something like an express train from behind and I fell to the ground with a surprisingly fast Oswaldo on top of me, his big, plump hand covering my mouth to stop me from crying out. "'You crazy Englishman!' he hissed. "'What the hell's the matter with you?' He took his hand away from my mouth. "'I heard Margosha's voice,' I managed to say. "'I'm sure of it.' "'Yes,' he replied in a whisper, Maybe you did, but you're not going to solve any problems by just going in there and asking to see her, are you? Oswaldo's nose says that would land us both in a lot of trouble, a great deal of trouble. It will be much better if we just wait and watch, watch and wait. Then we can decide what to do. So you stop behaving like a lovesick frog and do what I tell you. That was the agreement, wasn't it? Yes, I gasped, wishing he'd remove his great weight from my legs. Yes, but no buts, he hissed urgently. Look. Still lying on the ground, I looked at the terrace. Tibor had come back out of the house with another white-suited man who was carrying something heavy, something large, something with long red hair. And then I saw Malgosha's head fall back as they started down the steps that led to the jetty. I'm not cut out for heroism or dramatic gestures. I'm a viola player. I love music. I love compromise. I'm even a bit boring. That's why I probably behave a bit stupidly in dramatic situations, whether at Rosemary's front door or on a Brazilian hillside. This time there was no stopping me. Malgosha! I cried. Malgosha! And ran down the hillside. They'd heard me now. 
Tibor turned round and looked to see where the noise was coming from. The other man stopped. Two more men ran out onto the terrace and looked up. They pulled out guns. Malgosha! I cried again, and I saw her raise her beautiful head, and I thought I heard her say, Derek, Derek, please help me. But then there was a great bang, and something hit me hard on the side of my head. I felt my legs go weak, and the day went all dark on me. I heard running feet and more shouting, but now the noises seemed to be getting further and further away, and then, suddenly, there was complete silence. Strange noises, voices in the distance, footsteps going up and down somewhere near, echoing on a stone floor. There were unfamiliar smells, too. I seemed to be floating in a great black sea, cut off from some other world just the other side of the ocean. Derek, I heard a voice say thousands of miles away. Derek, can you hear me? He's still unconscious, somebody else said. Hadn't I heard that voice somewhere before? I tried to open my eyes but my eyelids were like anchors stuck in the mud of some deep river. Look, I saw his eyelid move, a third voice said. Just wishful thinking, said the first voice. Then the voices faded, and I was back in my silent black world. Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong? This time the voice was nearer. This time I was determined to open my eyes. I managed to raise the corner of one eyelid with what seemed like a great effort. I was blinded by bright white light and shut it again. There was someone by the side of my bed. My bed? I was in a bed? What on earth was going on? I forced my eye open again and managed to keep it open for a second longer. I was in some kind of a room with light green painted walls. I could see someone in a white coat standing next to me. A white coat? Oh, no. There was a picture starting up inside my head, a picture of two spacemen carrying something, carrying something like a sack of potatoes, something with beautiful red hair. Oh, gosh, I managed to whisper. Malkosha! What was that? What did you say? said the person beside me in a foreign accent. What did you say? But I had already made too much effort. The comfortable dark was asking for me again. The light faded. The voice disappeared. The next time I opened my eyes, Sandra was standing there. I blinked in surprise. Derek, she said, her eyes widening in surprise. Derek, you're conscious. Derek, what are you doing here? I managed to say. Where am I, anyway? Hospital, of course. Where else? Oh, it's so good to see you conscious. Wait, I'll go and tell the others. Back in a minute. Nurse! I heard her call as she left the room. I looked around me. It was a hospital, all right. There was a television on one wall, a large window with a view of the hills behind Rio, and light green walls with nothing on them at all. I looked down at the bed. There were tubes coming out of my arm. I moved my head. Ouch! It hurt. I put my hand up to the pain, but there was a large bandage around my forehead. Derek, a friendly voice said as Oswaldo came into the room. Are you all right? Please say you are all right. I'm all right, I think. My head hurts, Oswaldo, I replied. It was difficult to talk. You remember my name, at least, he laughed. 
Sandra had come into the room with Paul and a nurse, who was soon busy taking my pulse. They were all looking down at me and smiling. "'You all right, old chap?' Paul said. "'Yes, yes I am,' I replied, and I managed to sit up a bit more. "'Can somebody please tell me what I'm doing here?' So they did. They told me how I'd run down the hill when I'd seen Malgosha being carried to the plain. They told me how I'd shouted her name, and how Tibor's men had looked round, and how one of them had shot at me. "'You are a lucky Englishman,' Oswaldo laughed. "'You certainly are. I mean, the bullet hit you, right here,' he said, pointing his finger at the side of his head. And you should be dead, really. But the bullet did not go in. He used his finger again. It went across the side of your head, made a nasty mess. You were out cold. But it never touched that little brain of yours. Too small, I think. And he laughed. How did I get here? I asked them, to try and give myself time to think. You've got Oswaldo to thank for that, Paul said. He just picked you up and ran. He got you away and brought you here. That was four days ago. Yes, and you're too damned heavy, Oswaldo said. So don't ever be that crazy again, okay? Okay, I said weakly. I was beginning to feel bad again, and I wanted to go to sleep but there was something else I had to ask. "'What about Margosha? I said, but nobody answered me. "'Come on,' I said. I was desperate to find out before I fell asleep again. "'Derek, this isn't easy,' Sandra said. "'I know you've come all this way to find your wife. You nearly got yourself killed, too.' Well, this is going to be difficult for you, so I don't really know how to tell you. Tell me what, I said. I was beginning to feel really awful again. She means that your Malgosha isn't here anymore. That's what, Oswaldo said bluntly. She's gone. Gone, I repeated. Gone where? She's very ill, I heard, the detective went on. Very ill. What do you mean, she's very ill? Will somebody explain what's going on? I asked desperately. Please. Listen, old chap, Paul said. Oswaldo's been making inquiries. It seems they took your wife up to Recife three days ago. That's in the northeast of Brazil. Then they put her on a plane to Europe. Europe, I said, confused now and terribly worried. Where in Europe? Poland, Sandra said. Warsaw. Oswaldo thinks she's gone to Warsaw. Chapter 8 there's nothing for you here. Warsaw on a cold, rainy afternoon. The exact opposite of Rio de Janeiro. In Brazil, everything had been bright blue. In Warsaw that day, as I arrived from the airport, everything was grey. The concrete apartment blocks, dull against the wet afternoon. The tower of the Palace of Culture, that old communist monument, disappearing into the damp clouds. Yet I loved Poland. I had always been happy here. Malgosha's family had made me welcome the first time I had come. Even Anya, the one who had betrayed her sister, had been polite, though between her and Malgosha there was an icy formality. When Malgosha and I had been to visit her family, they had shown me the old parts of the city. They'd taken me to Krakow and Gdansk, driving over the long roads of this proud country with its unbeaten spirit, 
keeping its identity, despite the efforts of one foreign power after another over the long course of history, to squash its character. It made me realize where Margosha got her bright-eyed intelligence and her deep, dark passion. Everyone I met had always been friendly, and I had felt at home. Not this time, though. Now I was in a taxi, unhappy and confused, my head still bandaged, my mind trying to come to terms with all that had happened to me over the last week, my body tired and hurting terrible plain smell in my hair and on my clothes. And I was desperately worried, too. Worried about what my new Brazilian friends had told me. Worried about what I would find in Warsaw. The taxi stopped outside Margosha's parents' apartment block. I paid the driver in the Zlotis I had changed at the airport and rang the bell. A voice came through the intercom. A voice so like Malgosha's that just for a moment I was fooled. Malgosha, I said, hopefully. It's Derek. Derek, said the voice that I suddenly knew wasn't Malgosha at all. Derek, why have you come? Where's Malgosha? I shouted into the machine. Let me in, Anya, please. All right said the tinny voice at my ear. I suppose you'll have to come up. The buzzer sounded, and I pushed open the door. I took the lift up to the fourth floor. When I stepped out into the corridor, I saw that the door to the flat was open. I walked inside. Anya was standing there waiting for me, her arms folded. Her hair was cut short. She wore heavy black glasses. She watched me as I struggled in with my suitcase. She didn't look welcoming at all. "'What on earth are you doing here?' was the first thing she said, and then, almost without taking breath, "'My God, what's happened to you? You look absolutely terrible.' "'I feel terrible, all right,' I replied angrily. "'My wife's run off with someone else. I've been questioned by the police.' I've travelled halfway round the world. I've been shot at and nearly killed. Now my wife's supposed to be very ill, and I don't know why or where she is. But I know it's pretty damn serious. So, of course, I look terrible. I've just about had as much as I can take, all right? Poor old Derek, she said nastily. Am I supposed to feel sorry for you? I don't care whether you're sorry for me or not. I told her. I just want to know where my wife is. Oh, all right, she said. You'd better come in. Would you like a vodka or something? I think you're going to need it. She led me into the kitchen, took a bottle from the freezer, and poured a small measure into a glass. Go on, she said. It'll do you good. Well, it certainly can't make me feel worse than I do already. I took the glass from her and emptied it in one swallow. She filled my glass again. "'Aren't you going to have any?' I asked her. She wasn't hostile any more. She looked lost, like a child. "'I don't think so,' she whispered. "'I've had quite a lot already.' It suddenly occurred to me that the apartment was very empty— when I'd been there before, there were always people around. Malgosha's parents, her grandmother and grandfather, her brothers. Where is everybody? I said. At the hospital, she answered in a flat, toneless voice. At the hospital. They're all at the damned hospital. She had started to cry. Anya? I said with increasing terror. Anya, for God's sake, tell me what's going on. My sister's dying. That's what's going on. Maybe she's already dead, and I'm not there. Why not? I shouted at her. Why not? Because I don't dare. Because I can't bear it. 
because she was my best friend before Tibor. But that was years ago, I told her. You must have got over that by now. Oh, you fool, she replied, her eyes suddenly bright flames, almost unable to get her words out. Tibor and I, when he was in Europe, Every time he came here, for years, and then she took him away from me. She took him back, and now she's dying, and I can't bring myself to go and see her. God, I hate this life. She reached for another glass and filled it with the ice-cold vodka. She drank it quickly and had another, and another. If you want to go and join the party, she sneered, her cruel look back again, you'd better go to the central hospital. But hurry now, you don't want to miss the show. They all looked up when I went in. Margosha's mother smiled a brief little smile, and then turned back again to look through a window at a pale figure lying on a bed behind the glass. It was Margosha, her waxen features white against the flaming red of her hair. Margosha, I whispered stupidly. She wouldn't have been able to hear me anyway. Margosha, what's the matter? Nothing is the matter any more, her father said, turning towards me. His eyes were full of tears. You're too late, Derek. Where have you been? It took a bit of time for his words to sink in. It took me time to realize that Malgosha couldn't hear me in there. It took me time to realize that after all my journeying, I had finally found her, and it wouldn't do me any good at all. I don't know how long I stood there in that room with her family. I was too tired to feel anything, too shocked to understand what had happened, too alone to feel any warmth from the people around me. It was as if a hand of ice had gripped me and was slowly freezing all the life out of my body. I might have gone on standing there forever, but Malgosha's mother came up to me. Come on, Derek, she said, taking me by the arm. There's nothing we can do here. We'd better leave her now. Come back with us. There's a lot we need to talk about, though none of it really matters any more. We walked out of the hospital. We got into the family car and drove back through the streets of Warsaw in silence. When we got back to the apartment, Anya was nowhere to be seen. Nobody mentioned her absence. The vodka bottle on the kitchen table was empty. Somebody made some coffee. We all went into the lounge. We sat down in a black silence that seemed to suck the air out of the room. I felt as if I couldn't breathe. Instead of the questions I wanted to ask, there was a blank space in my brain where nothing moved, nothing was happening. Malgosha's father managed to ask his questions, though. What kind of a husband do you call yourself? was his first effort. What kind of a husband that lets this happen? Yatsek, please. Her mother stopped him, and then said something quickly in Polish, but it didn't seem to calm the unhappy man. I asked him a question, he insisted in English again. So the least he can do is give me a reply. I looked up at his face, all twisted with grief. I'm sorry was the only thing I could think of to say. I'm sorry, but I don't understand. I don't understand anything. You don't know why she was in Brazil. 
You don't know how she managed to get poisoned? Her father asked angrily, his words like gunshots in the tense silence. He had come to stand over me, and I could smell the cigarette smoke on his breath. Poisoned, I repeated. I hadn't the slightest idea what he was talking about. You didn't know? You didn't know about this? Margosha's mother said. Please, I said to her, to all of them in that room. I don't think I can take any more of this. I don't know anything about poison. The last time I saw Malgosha, in London, I mean, there was nothing wrong with her at all, except that she was about to leave me and I didn't realize it. And now, well, my God, I just... You see, I was having difficulty getting my words out. Look, I told them, since things had gone way too far for me to worry about my pride any more. Mao Gosha left me, all right? She left me to go and join Tibor. Remember him? That bastard, her father said. Hasn't he done enough damage in this family? The outside door opened and slammed shut. Anya came into the room. The perfect time, I heard her mother mutter under her breath. What? said Malgosha's sister, obviously drunk. Have I missed something? Why aren't you all at the hospital with my sister, who I love? She screamed and started to cry. Her grandmother went to her then and started to talk to her in a low, quiet voice. When she told her that her sister was dead, Anya started up a low, terrible moaning which seemed to go on and on. I wished she would just stop. Even when her father made me go with him into the kitchen, we could still hear it, the inhuman noise of someone who was going to feel guilty forever. But I had other things to worry about, because what Malgosha's father told me was that my wife had died, in the end, bleeding unstoppably, completely unable to breathe, both typical symptoms of someone who had been poisoned by some form of nerve gas, some kind of chemical agent. Nerve gas, I repeated stupidly. Yes, though they still have to do more tests. They haven't been able to identify what type it was yet. All the doctor will say is that he thinks she must have been exposed to some deadly chemical a few days ago. That's his guess, anyway. A few days ago, I said, still without understanding. Brazil. And you know nothing about this? Her father asked, looking at me suspiciously, with eyes red from weeping. No. No, honestly. Look, I'm just trying to absorb what you're telling me. I'm trying to come to terms with what's happened. And to tell you the truth, I'm not doing very well. I'm not doing very well at all. I desperately wanted to go on talking, drinking coffee, vodka, anything to deaden the pain I was feeling. But suddenly I could do nothing. I felt my legs go from under me, and yet again blackness washed over me like a wave, and I passed out. The funeral was as bad as a funeral could be, grey rain coming at us almost horizontally from a grey, cold sky, the voice of the priest at the graveside taken away from us by a bitter wind, the tears of the mourners invisible in the wet cold. I had recovered some of my physical health, but the colour of my mind was the colour of the sky, and I watched the ceremony with an uninvolved kind of despair. When it was over, we all went back to a hotel near the family flat and drank tea and vodka. Some of Malgosha's friends from school had come, and they tried to talk to me, to sympathise. 
but only two of them could speak English, and I wasn't really listening anyway. I had run out of things to say to my in-laws, my ex-in-laws, I suppose, and they didn't seem to know what to say to me. Anya walked up to me, dressed in black, a black hat covering her face, black glasses hiding her bruised eyes, almost black themselves from so much weeping. She was swaying slightly, a cigarette in one hand, a glass in the other. "'And now what?' she said in a slurred voice. "'What are you going to do now, brother-in-law, the one nobody ever fought over?' "'Anya,' I managed to reply. "'I'm sorry for everything that has happened. I'm sorry you are so hurt, and God knows I'm feeling sorry for myself.' So the last thing I need is for you to come up to me now and be so damned horrible. Just leave me alone, please. There's nothing for you here any more, she said drunkenly, like a spoiled child. Go home, Derek. Go home. And in the end, it seemed like good advice, though without Malgosha, I didn't really have a home any more. Still, I didn't belong here. Not now. The next day, I caught a flight back to London. It was a bumpy journey, with turbulence almost all the way. Most of the time, I half slept as the plane bounced through the skies, seeing horrible images in my half-dreams. Images of hospitals and speedboats, beaches and bodies. Malgosha and Tibor in a terrible musical dance of death across the glassy surface of the water. And then, just before we landed, I seemed to be with my quartet again, Rachel smiling at me on my right, Carl and Matt on my left, and when I woke up as the plane turned into its final approach to Heathrow, I was actually smiling. But not for long. The truth came home to me almost immediately as the British Airways Boeing 767 went through its final descent, and I sank back into the despair I had fallen into the moment I saw Malgosha's body lying behind the glass in that hospital room. I didn't think, then, that anything, least of all music, would ever pull me out of that. When the plane landed, it taxied away towards the terminal building. But then, unexpectedly, it came to a stop. The captain's voice came over the loudspeakers. This is your captain again, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry we've stopped, but we've got some visitors who want to come aboard. I'm sure it won't take very long, and then we'll make our way over to our landing gate as soon as possible. At the front of the plane, the flight attendants were opening the door. I looked out of the window and saw steps being driven up to the plane, followed by a police car, its blue light flashing in the darkness. Two men ran up the steps, and when they entered the plane, I knew at once who they were. They made straight for my seat. Mr. Armstrong said the older of the two policemen, who had visited me two weeks ago in London. I am glad to see you, to see that you've returned. Perhaps you'd like to come with me. And this time, his short-haired companion said, we don't want you running off again, do we? So you'd better put these on. Before I knew it, he had fitted handcuffs around my wrists, and I was led down the aisle of the plane in front of all those people down the steps, into the police car, and away towards whatever fate had in store for me.